good to see you. Uh, we're here with uh, lots of friends uh, to have uh, great conversations and um, take some questions. Uh, I just want to go through the kind of order of uh, what we're going to do here today. Um, I'm Mayor Kelly Gertz, I'm the Unified Government of athens Clark County, and I'm here to welcome you along with uh, Val McDaniel, who is Athens Housing Authority Chair. And uh, Val, do you want to help I'm, just, I'm just happy to be here as well. It's an opportunity to partner Unified Government, and we're so excited <coughs> to be a part of that, to bring some affordable housing at this community. All right, great. Uh, so uh, we're going to discuss the project, um, certainly have everybody introduce themselves in just a second uh, here, um, have about a half hour of questions and answers, and then uh, uh, Chairman Daniel and I are going to go and we're going to execute the Memorandum of Understanding that's been approved by both of these bodies. So I'm uh, very excited to be here. So uh, I'm going to begin just by uh, going around the table and letting everybody introduce themselves. Great. Right. Um, I'm Commissioner Mariah Parker, District 2. I'm Michelle Pearson, Commission with the Athens Housing Authority. My name is Arlene Stern. I'm Resident Commissioner on the Athens Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. I'm Jim Smith, Athens Housing Authority Commission. Val Daniel, Athens Housing Authority Commission. Charlie Maddox, Athens Housing Authority Commission. I'm Frank Platt, I'm with the Athens Housing Authority Commission. I'm Mike Snerdy, I'm the Athens Park County Commission. Russell Edwards, District 7 County Commission. Tim Denson, District 5 County Commission. Melissa Link, uh, District 3 Commission. Jerry Neesmith, District 3 Commissioner. Okay. Oh, you too. I'm Avina Farton, District 9 Commissioner. Well, we, uh, we couldn't be more excited to be here today. Um, as certainly we, uh, we announced on Friday and reiterated over the last several days, um, we've been fortunate to partner as two local public organizations, uh, along with two private development groups, the uh, Columbia Residential Group, as representatives here today, and the Jonathan Rose Group, uh, to seek a redevelopment of a broad swath of north downtown Athens. Certainly centralized on the, what's currently known as the Bethlehem Midtown Village area, but certainly transcending that, including public properties that surround it as well. Um, we've described this in many ways as having two perspective paths. Certainly the path that I think everybody who's sitting with us today desires to see is the path upon successful passage of the SPLOS referendum on November 5th of this year. Um, we have committed $39 million of the perspective $44.5 million affordable housing fund to redevelopment of this area. And as we go down that road, we're going to see transformational redevelopment that's going to retain at least as many deeply affordable <coughs> units as currently exist, along with a set of workforce housing units uh, that also would be likely subsidized through low income housing tax credits, and then a set of market rate units as well. Um, we are committed to both the sort of near-term success of the residents who currently live there, as well as playing the long game. So we want to make sure that everybody who currently lives in Bethel is able to return, um, that if there is any displacement, and, and we don't even know what that would look like because um, that, that has yet to be developed in terms of the specifics of the plan, if there is displacement that would be fully funded through the program, uh, nobody would pay a dime to move off the property or to move back on the property. And everybody who's a current Bethel resident would see their rent levels retain if they're retaining their current income level. Um, rents there, of course, are dependent upon their income level. So if somebody jumps from making $10 an hour to making $20 an hour, that'd be the only thing that would affect their level of rent. Um, we also believe that this is really going to be a uh, jewel of downtown in the long term. One of the challenges that we faced when this property came on the market in January is prospective competition from other bidders, um, particularly bidders who might be only interested in a for-profit component for this part of downtown, or who might be interested in unwinding the affordability in the near term. 
Um, what we as partners want to do is preserve the affordable component in the long term. So that certainly my son in 30 years would be able to walk through the property and know that it could be home to a broad swath of Athens. And, you know, including those who have lots of dollars in their pocket and, and those who are just getting started in life or who are on an upward trajectory. Um, I think it's fair to say we also recognize that simply having kind of multiple stratas of the income stream living next to each other, while it, you know, historically in research pace says that you lower crime, is the only thing that we have to do. Um, we have to ensure the social cohesion of the community. Uh, we have to ensure that we're injecting service supports into the community and that we're working hand in glove with those residents, uh, certainly as we've done through this transition. So uh, I'm going to shut up, but I'll just say um, I'm, I'm interested uh, in hearing uh, first from Valvin, but also from every member of both these bodies as, as they can express their thoughts and their desires for the future. Uh, and then again, we'll take some questions. Growing up in public housing, I grew up in broad acres, so it, it has a profound effect on making sure that all persons of all income can live together. In broad acres, when I was there, we had doctors, we had principals, we had teachers, all living in broad acres. You can imagine that. It didn't matter what you were making, what I was making, and that was our perception of Columbia Brookside. We know as a housing authority that HUD presently want to eliminate all public housing. And that's why we went to the Columbia Brookside partnership with the Jack All Wells Project to make sure that low income housing maintained and people can feel good about where they live regardless of income. It's so important that they become a part of it. That regardless of how much you make, it doesn't matter. As long as I take care of my place, you take your place, you take care of your children, I take care of my children, and we can live in a homeowner's relationship. And that's the whole idea. And I, I want to share this with you. I, I was at the Notre Dame Georgia game a week ago. And we had 93,000 people there cheering. It didn't matter what color the person was in scored the touchdown. All that mattered was that was at the University of Georgia. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful? That we could have a society like that. Four hours we were like that. <laughs> Think about that now. Four hours we did not care who scored, as long as the Georgia Bulldogs, we're all happy. That's what kind of society we need to have lifelong. It doesn't matter what color you are, as long as we're working together for a common core. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to open it up to some other input from commissioners, and uh, I will say that. Uh, this has been a collaborative effort, not only in this last year plus when we've been very actively at the table together, uh, but really over multiple years. Uh, I think Mike has thought a lot about how uh, the moving pieces of the geography of Athens can fit together in a positive way for public and private benefit. Uh, certainly, uh, Commissioner Thorpe Navita has, has been at the table with residents uh, at their dining room tables taking care of them and their babies for many years. So uh, this is something we've all got to stake in. I will say something, Kelly, and, uh, and I appreciate the words of Dr. Daniels and yourself and certainly the authority uh, members being here. The, uh, the thing I would like to say is that this presents our community with a great opportunity. I mean, not, I'm hard pressed to think about how many communities or, or even counties in the state of Georgia, much less in the country, have committed $40 million to, to an affordable housing project in Kipuna that is designed to help uh, make life better. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, the community will receive this well and that, uh, and that we can get moving on. So, because I think it would be a transformational thing for, for a lot of lives and, and for athletes. I want to quell some of the questions and cut concern that some people have because this is what we on this side went through through all of Jack Hall with that. Poor people are gonna be misplaced. They're not gonna have anywhere to go. Where are they going? All the people that Jack Hall Wells didn't come back. Whoever's telling that, they just tell them about. Okay. Under the guidelines, they have to come back. But let at that the other day, I'm not gonna tell you what I was doing when I came up with this rig. <laughs> Even the people that don't come back, guess what? Someone that qualifies will be in that position. There will be no less units 
for a public housing resident, no matter what, if nobody comes back, everybody says, I'm just happy as I can be, it will still be that same number of units for a qualified person on the waiting room, whether that individual comes back or not. No student, no rich guy, rich lady, none of these people will be able to fill that slot that's allocated by the contract, by our agreement with HUD. So that, that's one of the things we've heard and we still hear. Oh, they're not coming back. They're not. Well, that's a choice that they made on different areas. But I can assure you that if they don't, someone that meets the public housing authority guidelines will be in those units. So I, that that takes away all the other what ifs and what ends on who's coming back. I'm going to uh, follow uh, that statement because I've heard it too. And I've heard it from and people from some people I thought were intelligent. <laughs> um, and I got really tired of hearing it. So this is how I answer this question already. Give me the name of one person, just one. Give me their name and their contact. I will follow up with them personal, personally. And if it is true, that means I'm lying. That means I've been telling a lie all this long. Nobody can give me nobody's name. Nobody can tell me where nobody's at. The folks that I know personally who do not go back, they have told me personally that was their choice. Nobody's taken away anybody's choice. I am so glad that we are making this move. The, oh, the other argument I get is this does not create wealth. It wasn't designed to create wealth. It's designed to be a stepping stone towards wealth. As we do this, we should be in immediate conversation about home ownership. This conversation should go right into how do we create home ownership. And I want, and the oddest part about it, home ownership is a big responsibility. And a lot of folks don't understand. When I get my taxes at the end of the year and have to fix something, that ain't no play job. So when we talk about we want people in homes, are we putting them in homes for a temporary vacation because they're going to lose it sooner or later for whatever? We need to prepare people for those moves. So this, to me, takes care of an immediate problem for us to move forward to something else. I, I, I'm ready to start talking about home ownership and what that looks like. Um. The big thing that I hear over and over again is the concerns about folks being displaced. And, um, you know, throughout the conversations that we've had about this for going on three years now, that that concern was always at the forefront of our, our conversation. And we are committed to making sure that anybody who lives in this community definitely comes back. But also that the process for moving people out and, and building new properties, that there, there's a possibility of keeping them as close as possible to the community. And Commissioner Benson and I were just talking, and you look at the footprint of what's there now and how low the density is. I'm really committed to pushing that we explore a phasing of the project that allows as many people as possible to stay on site and in the immediate area. Um, you know, so folks aren't moving across town. Um, but I mean, there's such, so much possibility here because of its downtown urban location and because of the possibilities for mixed use. We're not only creating housing, but we're, we have the potential to create real opportunity and real jobs for people and real services. Um, you know, to have some of those wraparound services on site, there is a health clinic right there. There's a possibility for some real child care. You know, we've got the Linden House right there. We have the park right there. We have the, the potential to create a, a truly diverse and holistic community. Um, and, and that's what we really need to do more of in general, in Athens and, and across the country. Um, 
I uh, apologize for my casual attire. I've been working outside and chasing my son around. <laughs> but, uh, this, uh, th this project is a case where the government is acting to renovate and restore a privately held apartment complex. You know, privately held apartment complex owned by a landlord that lives in Atlanta. I've driven through Bethel Homes the past year and just seen it. A, a tremendous amount of litter and garbage and broken down fences. Uh, it, it, was, it was a sad place to see. It was a sad place to see. And, you know, there's folks who do business and private real estate operators. Sometimes, for whatever reason, they just don't care. <coughs> They just don't care about what they own and what they provide. Luckily, in this situation, uh, an opportunity presented itself for the government, Athens Clark County, to cooperate with that Athens Housing Authority to purchase this privately held apartment complex and renovate it, build something new for the folks that live there. Uh, this private entity secured loans to renovate some years ago that were backed by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Because those loans were backed by that entity, they had to provide Section 8. That obligation will carry forward with what the government is going to do here. And like Mr. Maddox said, we're going to provide the same number of affordable units, if not more. So I think this is a great step, a great opportunity being seized by these two governmental authorities to step up to the plate and beautify a neglected, privately held <coughs> apartment that was in disrepair and neglected and was not a safe place for children to live. The number of shootings we've had the past few months in that area is reprehensible. I know uh, one of them occurred on a playground and children at Barrow Elementary witnessed it. That's why we're around this table today and I'm proud to sit at this table to stand with our partners here, the Housing Authority, and take a step forward to take over control of this privately held apartment and turn it into something that I think the Athens community is going to be very proud of and uh, will provide a safer, more livable place for the children of this community and for the students of Barrow Elementary. Thank you, everybody who's worked on this project, staff at Athens Housing Authority, the staff in the manager's office, everybody around the state. I'm excited. Okay. Like, I'd like to piggyback a, a little bit on what he just said. Uh, years ago, there were some studies done uh, in my early career as a police officer. It's called a broken window syndrome. It's a, it's a section of a city up north somewhere. I can't remember exactly. But, uh, they went in there and they had all the broken windows, cleaned it up, and they, they just, uh, track crime in that area uh, for a certain amount of time. And crime actually went down. And, and the only thing I wanted to say is that um, with me, this is a quality of life issue for the residents and, uh, that are there now and future residents, beginning with the physical condition of that property. And it is a mess. And if you don't believe it, y'all are throwing some of the units down there. And, uh, and I think once that is accomplished, then all the other things need to be. You don't just leave it alone at that. Uh, there are other social issues that need to be addressed with, with, with people that live there. But, uh, but
but you, I, I, I agree with you. Um, and, and like I said, I was a police officer here for 41 years, and I, I can tell you some stories about it. But, um, <clears throat> Um, I just wanted to reiterate some comments I made at the meeting last night regarding the precedent that had been set historically for developments like these and the very real fears that some people have regarding um, what this looks like. It may not have been true for Jack R. Wells' development, but in the era of urban renewal, um, guided by an ideology of white supremacy, uh, developments like these gave way to new structures and new institutions that did not benefit the people of communities like Wixkillet or the Bottoms or Lennon Town. And that now, perhaps too late, we are beginning to study and understand the gravity of. And I bring this up because I don't want to dismiss people who want to stay involved in the process, who are worried about the process who believe that oversight is necessary. Um, I want to invite those people into the conversation because I think that as long as we are partnered throughout this process, we can ensure that it is equitable and just for all parties involved, the residents of this um, development especially. And to ask um, if there are currently scheduled any future touch points for people to come converse with the folks sitting at this table about what um, steps to come will look like. To that question, yeah. Commissioner, um, the, the intent is, and I've had my conversations with folks at the Housing Authority, including Director Rick Parker, who's here, uh, about having very frequent touch points. Uh, obviously, there will be that design and planning process that involves what the sticks and bricks will look like, what kind of amenities are on site where the garden will be, where the playground will be, where the parking lots will be, um, you know, where you know, there will be a pond or a fountain there, all, all those kind of physical things. Um, but what we really want to do is make sure that, you know, that's not a one and done. Mm -hmm. But in fact, that we're having very consistent meetings and we're very consistent communication with the current residents and with the public at large. Yeah. And, and so I would anticipate a newsletter cycle that's going to go forward for many years to come, in which we give regular updates and have regular interactive sessions. Great. Yeah, I think with all of those in place, I have confidence that this can be a great benefit for our community. I just wanted to say that, um, and I'm sure everybody knows that, uh, as a resident in public housing, I live in Dennis Tower, so I live right across the street from Bethel, and I've seen it go down. Um, I've seen the trash that you talk about. I've seen things that go on that shouldn't be going on. And it's real important, I think, that because they were neglected for so long, if, if, if the management didn't care about them, then they didn't care about the property. It wasn't their home or not their home. It's a place to stay. And I think we're trying to make it where it's their home and safe for the children, safe for the families, and safe for our senior citizens. Since Rick is not up here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give him credit so I don't get sued or anything. <laughs> I'm not sure about this shit here. <laughs> uh, you, you know, one of the things that led us through the Jack Hall Wells and led us to this is the people that sit on this side. And, and our main thing has always been what's best for the community. Uh, and as we got ready to do that, we found a wonderful partner in Columbia Development. Not just, oh, they got all these slides and stuff like that, but actually to view what they had done 10, 15 years ago, not just this past week or not this new thing. And even the tenant, they had input into moving partners and, and they've proven themselves beyond the shadow of a doubt as to what we are doing there. As uh, Commissioner said, I remember urban removal. They said uh, urban renewal, but I remember that. When it came through and some folks never recovered. I remember model cities, and I remember all of that kind of stuff. 
But now on the inside, I see that unless somebody wants to go to jail, unless Jim Brown and they want to lose a lot of money, they got to stick by the rule. They got to play the game fair because if they're in violation of not allowing some person to come back or this, that, then their money is really at risk. They, they wind up doing that. So again, the biggest fear that I hear people talking about is you're not going to do this for poor people. They're not going to have a tax place. I live in Bethlehem. I was one of the first residents there in 1969. I raised my first daughter there. She's now adopted in Milwaukee. I lived there. It, it was a wonderful place. It, we had local management and we had local people that the resident, we knew if you didn't do right, you were gone. And as it's how with our people know it. If you don't do right in Adam's house, you're going. You go. The rule is we're not going to come up with a new rule. We're not going to have to start doing something we're not doing. This is the rule. You can go to any of our developments and any of our properties and say, wow. And many people have done that because it comes down to a management team, a board of governors that care, and we have that. And now in this new development, we have a partner. And they, they've done this, and they take pride in that too. So there is no way that anything urban or unrenewable or mobile small cities and all that will happen because we know what's going on. See, too many times people didn't know what was going on when urban renewal came. They didn't know what was happening. Well, I think we've done a great job of getting everybody involved, everybody knowing everything there is to know about it. And that as we go forward with the many meetings that we will have with the residents, they will feel more and more comfortable because something has to be done. <clears throat> and what drove that place down was out of town, out of care and match. And now we're here and we're able to change it. And with the help of the Mayor Commission, the dollars are there that we can bring it back to life. Because as uh, Chairman Daniel said, one of the most important things is where do you live? And, and, and you know that too, Russ. Where, where do you live? Look, that was, look, abstract, yes. <laughs> that, that, that's a down mark. I remember when that was an uptick. Mm -hmm. And we want to bring it back to that. And, and by bringing all the other things that you all are available now, we can do this. It, it's good. Why wouldn't we do it? Jerry. Yeah, I just want to reflect back as it is. I think to the public, this might look like something that suddenly happened <laughs> within the last two weeks. That's not the case. <laughs> this has been brewing uh, for how long, Kelly? Four years? At least. At least. So Nancy Denson was in the and facilitated it. Um, Rick Parker has been the guy that's been down in the trenches figuring out the finances and the, in, the engineering costs and doing all this homework that are incredibly important to figure out how much is this going to cost, is it feasible, and who's going to do it. This has all been going on behind the scenes. Uh, so a lot, a lot of people who aren't here tonight, including former commissioners uh, from the last class and the mayor, uh, deserve some credit, a lot of credit here. Uh, but I got to say, uh, Rick Parker made us feel confident that he knew what he was doing, honestly. And, and so we were able to, to take the next step and the next step. And he navigated through these negotiations and, and all of this stuff, just, just absolutely brilliant, brilliant. And, and the work on the last project that happened before we gave us confidence that everybody involved knew what they were doing. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And yeah, uh, first I just want to uh, thank uh, Bethlehem Rick Parker and entire board for, I know y'all did uh, a lot of work um, throughout this, so I appreciate y'all doing that and carrying it. Um, and then definitely everybody who was here before we came on, because I'll admit, remember, I came on um, and there was a lot of uh, necessary secrecy around uh, this project due to it, a land purchase. And so when I came on, I had a lot of uh, questions and concerns. So I definitely understand uh, why people and the community who are just now hearing about this also have questions and concerns. Um, and I think that's valid. 
Um, but I don't think that that needs to turn into, um, it's unfortunate that that's turned into a lot of the misinformation instead of just questions and concerns. Um, and I appreciate uh, um, uh, Maddox's comments and real comments about we're not going, anybody who doesn't come back to this, they're, they're not coming back because they chose to come back. Um, this body, and I'm sure this board, would not be supporting this project if that wasn't true. And um, I do also uh, agree with Commissioner Link that I would love to uh, see a way for us to do this in phases that we can absolutely limit uh, displacement to potentially nobody being displaced off of this track. Um, if we can do that in a way, I think that that should be prioritized. Um, but going back to the concerns people have, uh, I've been to Bethel. Anybody who's been to Bethel understands that things could not continue the way they, they were. Um, there was a delinquent landlord situation, basically. And I think this project is able to uh, take back that, that, that land, as Commissioner Edwards said, from this private developer who was not doing, giving the, the residents there the, the, the care they, did, they deserved, and instead of taking it back and giving it back to the people. I think that's the mission that, that I see in this. And I understand that the history that's there and that's valid, we need to keep uh, be aware of that and always keep that in check. But I think it is so important that this community, this body, we have to believe that there's a right way to do this. Because we have to do something. There has to be a right way that we can help people get to this quality of life that everyone deserves. And that's, to do that, it's to, we have to provide quality housing to people with the wraparound services that we put here. But we have to believe there is a, a proper and a right way that puts people first that we can do this. And that's what this body, these two bodies, are trying to do. Um, so I really, anybody who's got those questions, concerns, which again, I had at the beginning, um, we'll answer those, we'll, be, we'll engage with those, but please try to be cooperative with us and try to make this successful instead of hoping that it sinks. Jim. Well, a very brief comment, uh, although it's certainly true that this did not happen overnight or even in the last month, I think it's important to realize that we're essentially still near the beginning of a long process. If it's a nine-inning game, maybe in the second inning, uh, the effect. We have a reason to be optimistic, and I'm highly excited, so also a board, I'm glad the commission is as well, but there will be a lot of hard work and a lot of planning and many more things to do. And today is a milestone, a reason for celebration, but it's a celebration near the starting point for what will be not only a long process. We have the property of a contract, but we don't own or control it one bit until a closing will take place later, if and when we get there, which I expect we will. Yeah. I, most of the conversation has been centered around the um, infrastructure, the building, the bricks and mortar. Uh, but we've got to make sure we keep the residents in front. Um, when people do not have hope, you're not going to get a lot out of them. There's a need to reestablish the residents' association. Just like we talk about mentoring kids with all the mentoring programs we have in the community, we have to have folks to step up and mentor families. Um, we have to ask our faith-based uh, groups to, to come into our community. It is going to take a while before everything starts looking like we are envisioning or what we imagine, but there are some things that we can do now. Because if we educate and support these families now, we won't have to worry about urban removal. We won't have to worry about people speaking for other people because they will have the tools and the skills to speak for themselves. We need to give people knowledge and information and set them free. Uh, we should not be trying to enable folks. And a lot of times when we get in certain positions, it's almost like, oh, I know something that you don't know. But we need, if we have information that we can get out there, the workshop that Tim and I were at today on economic development, I learned a lot. And I wish I had have known that before I got on this commission. Um, I probably would be a ring, but, um, but I learned a lot. We have to know that these residents 
are poor. They're not stupid. They're not dumb. We have to give them this information and let them loose. And they will do the right things because they will be doing it for themselves and not be doing it for them. This hand, the days of handouts and giveaways is over with. It's over with. It's not coming back. And I do believe that's been one of our problems in society. We've done too much giveaway, giveaway, and no responsibility. But everything we do, there is a consequence. We all have to be accountable for what we do. And now you have folks, they feel like they're entitled. They, it don't matter. And then when you get put out, all you hear about the back, but what did you do to get put out? You know. So we got to help people to understand that, you know, there's just responsibility. And I believe if you sit down and talk to folk like they are human beings, intelligent, they'll get it. You don't talk down to people. You lift folk up. And if you can't say nothing good, just need to be quiet and let somebody else speak. But I hope we don't forget about the capital investment that is going to be needed to lift these folk up. It's not going to be bricks and mortar. It's got to be some hands-on involved. I see Pastor Betsy here. I just want to thank her um, for all you've done. Um, I got a little jealous there for a minute. Took my babies, but um, and um, uh, Mimi Gallagher. There are names of folk that have really invested in these folk. And so we need, but we need more names. We need more people to step up. And that's while we're building this building, let's build up the folk at the same time. I left our meeting on Friday with the residents, very hopeful and optimistic. Um, like Ovita, the core of this is yes, we're talking about brick and mortar in the building, but it really boils down to the people. And so I was glad to hear that we came together to have that meeting on Friday and talk to the residents that are living in Bethel now first. Um, and they had an opportunity to ask their questions, they had an opportunity to express their concerns. And from that meeting here and positive feedback from them was exciting and inspiring, but it also took me back to when the Housing Authority undertook this very similar project with Jeff R. Wells, because that's exactly what we did. And I remember month after month at board meetings, sometimes multiple board meetings in a month, and I affectionately known our 7 a.m. problematics meetings, <laughs> that we were hearing all of the outside folks, all of the media folks, everyone who did not live in our community <coughs> had their thoughts comments and their feedback, that they had all the issues, all these concerns that our own residents who we talked to one by one, house by house, did not because they were every part of the project. So I'm very hopeful and excited that we're able to come together as a team on this because at this point, the housing authority has a blueprint that we work with Columbia Residential then. And if we continue to follow the process that we went through then with keeping the residents in the game, letting them drive the car. We did not. The reason there was a pool there, the reason there are computers in there, the reason there's a gym, that's because that's what they said they wanted to see in their community. And we said, okay, we followed that process. And so I think if we continue to do that and stay engaged, I'm hopeful about this project because we're, we're going to hear it regardless um, whether, Sam, to your point, you know, it's going to happen and that's okay. But I think we have to remember that we need to listen to the residents first because that's who, who we're impacting. We're the, that's who's moving, that's who lives we're touching. And so I'm excited that, that we have been able to come together and add one more partner with the county um, being a part of this project, but also knowing that we have a blueprint, we have a process that we've worked in the past, so as we move forward, I think we're gonna be in demand. Thank you, Sheila. Patrick? All right, y'all, um, I think we'll, uh, pause at this point and uh, spend just a little bit taking questions from anybody who's here in the room. Uh, I know we've covered some ground that probably folks were interested in, but if there are any questions where you'd like a deeper dive or there's an aspect of this, uh, either historically or just in terms of perspectively what we're going to be looking at in the months ahead, uh, we'd definitely be happy to answer anything that's on anybody's mind um, before uh, Jared Daniel and I go execute MOU. Yes, ma'am. Um, being a senior citizen myself and knowing that uh, Brookside Columbia has a certain building uh, just for seniors, uh, do we know yet if that's going to happen in this development? Uh, certainly it very well could. 
uh, I, I would find it likely that it would, um, particularly if you think about the very broader area that's not just the 13, nearly 13 acres of Bethel Midtown Village, but the 20 acre expanded area. I would, I would anticipate more senior housing. Oh, so I want to go back to something that Commissioner Parker and Mr. Knox talked about as far as the history of the city and um, the impact of urban renewal and a lot of people's concerns of if, if this is going to be another one. Um, just as Mr. Knox said, there's not a lot of people who know about that history. You lived it. There's a lot of people who who are alive, who, who can talk about that, but they're not heard. Um, I've been working with a lot of folks from Lindentown for the first time that they are actually heard. I hear a lot of frustration coming from some of you about, this isn't urban renewal. It's not pushing back against us. That's the tenor that I hear. And that's the tenor that other people will hear. Don't do that. Instead, teach people what that history is and own it. Because when you do that, you actually humanize what happened, both past and present. And you respect the people who live in Bethel now, who may actually continue to ask you and are afraid. If you want to gain the trust of people, then teach history as it really happened and own it. There are lots of ways to do that. So I want to encourage both bodies to make an effort throughout this process to teach what urban renewal was in the city. Because you'll find that when you do that, there's a lot of people in the white communities who need to know that. Because they may jump into this and think that everything is going to go smoothly. No plan goes smoothly. And along the way, you have to find way to fill those gaps. Teach what urban renewal really was. All, all the residents from Lennon Town. They want other people to know what happened to them. Teach what happened at the site of Bethel. Because that is how you start to rebuild a community that has felt, that has not just felt, but has been so <coughs> pushed out. Uh, so I, and I want to encourage you, as, as a way to listen to residents, to, to reiterate what Commissioner Thornton has to emphasize, to put residents first. This is how you put residents first, by telling real histories and not being afraid of it, and even if you are afraid of it. Because to be honest, we, we don't have to believe that this <laughs> is going to work. We don't have to make that belief at first. We need evidence coming from you. You're the ones accountable. We don't need to believe that. We have to have evidence. So give that evidence. And one way to do that is teaching history in a real way. So that's my encouragement to you. Okay. I don't know how to say this and just just say it, but I'll just say it. Um, this is not our job, per se. You said us. This is a community thing. What I would like for you to do and anybody else, if you have something to offer to the table, like, Oh, I'd like to work with the residents about urban renewal. Nobody's going to push back on that. Nobody's going to say, no, uh, we don't want to give food or whatever. You know, there's a lot to being an elected official, which I am really getting a little nervous <laughs> about at times. But most of us that ran this last time, we ran on a platform of committee, I mean community, not not the, the, the big the big eyes and the little U's. So we need I'm, that's not my expertise of teaching or that's not me. But if you say, Alita, let's have a forum on urban renewal, 
Let's do that. You got experts here. You got folk that went through it. Let's do it. So you volunteer. People need to tell us what you want to do, and let's do it together. But please don't give me nothing else to do. But the besides Miss Pratt. And I, we're probably the only two people in here that live through urban renewal. And I can assure you that there are nine people at this table that wouldn't have, that didn't have a chance of being at the table when they came through with that. Most, and that nine out of 15 of the people sitting here couldn't have been there. And, and probably the other five couldn't have been there either. Um, <laughs> when they brought in Marvel City. See, we have to put this in perspective when we talk. It was segregation, right? Okay. okay. We had broad acres and we had park people. It was segregation. It was a whole different thing, and none of the people that sat at that table, good or not good, had any intention of doing anything other than to make money what they would do. So now we have a community involved, and we're asking everybody in the community to come, because it's going to be one of those, either you're with us, or you're against us. <laughs> and as you say, we've got to do something. And uh, I've heard so many stories, just like I hear about people not being able to go back. I hear horror stories about urban renewal. And believe it or not, that was, that was some fairly good stories about urban renewal. Some, some people got wealth and all of that. And I've got people that look like me. So it wasn't all of that. But we need to tell the whole story. But again, we learn from history. And I think because we're sitting around here, yeah, we can teach them that what happened. It doesn't have a chance of happening with this group. But the people that we have a voice now. But we don't need to forget about it. We don't need to go back and dig old graves and do all this. But we, we have learned and we invite everybody everybody to come to any of these meetings and come with something productive and let's share and let's move on because the train is pulling out <laughs> everybody getting on get on everybody getting on get on okay. i'm going to come back around okay. Mike. so i find that the the thing about displacement and then the response from, you know, the very recent response from the community, uh, which is called dissent. A lot of people agree with the Bethel Home Project, project I trust the project, and a lot of people didn't uh, trust in the project and, and haven't yet. But I remember Charlie in 2010 at the Sine at the mayoral forum, when the moderator asked the question, there's about six or seven <coughs> candidates up there, including Mr. Maddox, uh, do you support public housing? Charlie Maddox was the only one that raised his hand. Okay, so, and then the moderator brought the question to the audience and there was about 50 or 60, 50 people in there. We had just really started a new wave of community forums and town halls at that time and two people raised their hand out of 50. And the, a, a, a good many of the audience kind of laughed about that, okay? So you were the dissent in 2010, but you were the singular dissent. So now we come back to 2020 or near 2020, and I just want to say that at least among the uh, younger generations, in my opinion, displacement is the number one issue. But the difference between 2010 and 2020 is, is these people that feel displacement is a, a top issue of anti-poverty struggles, mm -hmm. they will work with you and they'll work <coughs> for the community if they don't feel like that there's an air of, oh, we're doing this and this and that. And so, so thank you, Charlie, for being the only person at that table to support public housing in 2010, okay? And then, and then my question is, my question, so remember these kids want to help y'all, and they will work a lot of hours both in the community and in front of the computer to make it a success. 
And then my uh, last question is, uh, it's a transportation issue. I'm assuming that we're going to have some economic development features and maybe some child care features. But people in Athens, students at Athens Tech, are the only students now in Athens, Georgia, that can't get on a bus for free. So that might be one reason of many why people don't trust the status quo. So the question is, is, is the community, what, for Kelly or whoever else wants to answer, the question is, is the community, and, and for mobility issues across the board, uh, is, is uh, it, are the people at the new, in the new community, the North Athens new community, are they going to be able to get on the bus and go to Athens Tech without having to pay a fare? Well, I, I'll kind of start broadly, Michael, and kind of then narrow in. Uh, at the point when discussing this project earlier today and affordable housing broadly, that you always have to think about affordable housing in a bigger context than just where do you lay your head. Um, that, that, that's a piece of the conversation in terms of community health and community dynamics. But you also have to think about people's upward trajectory. You have to think about their own individual life development. You have to think about job opportunities that exist and higher education opportunities that exist in the community. And so um, a lot of the programming at Athens Technical College reflects the kind of things that we would like to see people be able to move into. Um, the commission has made a commitment to workforce development, <coughs> dollars to workforce development, new local dollars, just in this current fiscal year. So I think you, you certainly see the members of that body standing strong behind that. Um, just in terms of the nuts and bolts, and you know this because you've been an advocate for transit uh, access in the past, the reason that uh, University of Georgia students have fair free access to transit is because that's part of their steep fee. And so that's sort of an institutional priority that the university's made, Piedmont College has, has made that a priority. Um, we are certainly talking about ways broadly that we could enhance our transit programming and moving toward fair free access for seniors and disabled in this current fiscal year for K-12 and younger students a few years ago. Um, I, I think you're probably going to see some new innovations in the next few years, um, but very broadly. We want, because Ovita kind of really kind of hit the high note on, to make sure that we're not just talking about a better place, you know, granite countertops, stainless steel appliances, but we're talking about the better life opportunities, and I think that has to include higher education. So, so the very brief follow-up question, do you want the, the, the people, the really of all ages at the community, to be able to get off the bus and go straight to Athens Tech without having to pay? I, I do, and in fact, uh, I mean, just this fiscal year, uh, we made the commitment so that they can get there not only from the south but from the north uh, down highway 29 and so i think we'll be seeing some programming innovations in the next couple of years yeah not really exactly what those will look like we'll, we'll see i just was uh, part of a phone conversation with kevin tanner from uh, the georgia house of representatives who's chair of the transportation committee about how some of this could look that's great thank y'all for all your care hi i just have a logistics question to help me understand it because there's a lot of discussion about repla uh, displacement um how does it actually like happen like what's going to happen uh, if i were living there um you know am i going to be how do i find another place and come back i just like wonder what the logistics are someone talked about doing it in stages but and i don't know if the other development how it happened so what happens like what's the process for the residents in a situation or has been it may be different i understand but the, the process of the residents will get a voucher mm -hmm. they can take that voucher and find their, their place how um, I, I hate to stop you Go that was the that was the process for Brookside because the subsidy at Brookside uh, was public housing. These are Section 8 subsidies, and so vouchers will not necessarily be used. They will stay on a lease with that property and will sublease if necessary. They'll never really leave the, the control of the property, so they'll always have the right to come back because it's a different kind of subsidy. Sorry, no, no, just, thank you. It's a, it's a different kind of subsidy. So let me take a stab at the question of the process. Yeah. And Jim, please feel the jump at my business partner, our business partners here as well. Um, 
First of all, we are meeting with every single resident family individually before we ever take possession. And if relocation becomes necessary, there'll be a full-time staff person that will hand walk them and actually a department at uh, Jim, at our business partners, Columbia Residentials Company, that does these relocations. We will hand hold them all the way through the process. We will help them locate people. We will not simply say, because it's not public housing, the voucher situation, we'll be helping them locate uh, suitable apartments or locations for their family. They'll have input into that. We're not just gonna say, okay, this is it, and take it or leave it. We'll be walking them and hand holding them through the process the entire way. Every penny of all the costs to move, all the connection fees, everything associated with the move will be completely borne by us. No resident will be out of dime for the move away or the move back. We're currently, to address Commissioner Link's concerns, we are seriously looking at methodologies because those Section 8, uh, those Section 8 subsidies are so valuable and you do not want to lose them under any set of circumstances because we're committed to having all 190 stay with the property. We're gonna be very, very careful about how we do that, including looking at whether or not we can do a situation where we do some consolidation moves to one side of the property and develop it in phases. If we do the Brookside-like transformational project that we all hope we'll be able to do, it will have to be done in phases. You cannot get enough tax credits in any round of tax credit awards from the state to do this big a job in one lump transaction. Um, there's a limit as to how many you can get in any one given year, so it will absolutely positively have to be uh, have to be done in phases. The fact that it has to be done in phases and the fact that so much of the property is vacant right now gives us some unique opportunities to address just exactly those various concerns. I will, however, tell you the same thing that we have told the residents from the start, and that is we want to be totally honest, totally transparent. We're going to have many, 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 many meetings, dozens and dozens of meetings. We're going to stay engaged and we're gonna try very hard never to make a promise that we can't keep. That's how you win trust. That's how you win trust with the residents. That's how you win trust with the public. You stay engaged. You have you know, lots and lots of meetings. You are as transparent and truthful as you can possibly be. And you try really hard not to make any promises. So I'm not making any promises that the approach is going to be uh, a phased approach. Uh, I'm telling you that we're looking at that very, very carefully. So I hope that answers your question. It, it helps a lot. And while you were at, telling me that, and I was listening very carefully, I came up with another very complicated question. <laughs> okay. I mean, how many units are there now, and how many units will there be that are affordable, and how many units will there be that are private? I don't quite understand okay. the private. So, um, or similar to what we did at Brookside. <laughs> Brookside is one third deep subsidy public housing, one third workforce housing in the form that is modest subsidy, which is tax low income housing tax credit, and one third market rate. And those, that mix uh, allows for a, a very wholesome community. It also allows for the development of the property in such a way that every single unit is built to exactly the same standard. So it does, so for example, the, at Brookside, when you knock on a door, you can't tell who you're knocking on, and every unit is built exactly the same way. So the public housing residents at Brookside are receiving a unit and living in a unit that looks exactly like the market rate units and is built to full market rate standards. So you're really lifting up uh, those populations and giving them uh, a unit and a lifestyle that might not be possible if you weren't functioning a mixed income where you've got sort of, it's not really true, so don't have a heart attack when I say this, Jim, or anybody else. It's its not cross-subsidization, but it sort of is, in that the presence of all those income streams on the property allows for something greater than the individual whole if you tried to do any one of them um, as, a, as a standalone without the mixed 
income. What's the difference the between those two, the deep subsidy and the workforce rate? Okay. So when I, that's a good question. What, what deep subsidy, what I mean by deep subsidy is, and that includes Section 8, it includes public housing, those kinds of programs. A deep subsidy program would be defined as where your rent floats entirely based on your income. So if you make a very tiny income, you pay a very tiny rent. And when your income goes up, you pay a slightly higher rent. And by the way, when your income goes down, in most uh, rental situations, your rent never goes down. You know, yeah. a normal rental unit, when your income goes down, that's just too bad. In a deep subsidy program, when your income goes down, your rent also goes, goes down. So that's the Section 8 subsidies that are there on the property now. There are 190 units, and we intend to, to uh, maintain that 190 units. What I mean by uh, workforce housing is that is not run through the U.S. Department of Housing and Development. That's a function of the uh, Internal Revenue Code of the United States of America in which low-income housing tax credits are available and sold to people who need to offset their taxes. And the sales of those low-income housing tax credits create a huge pile of equity that can be used to build the property and draw down the amount of debt that you have to have on the property, which allows you to set a more affordable rent than a market rent. And by law, and Jim, you can, uh, you can check me on this, I'll let him give me the percentages so I don't get it wrong. By law, the, the rents are set for those at what percent of median income? Hi, I'm Jim Brown at Columbia Residential. I'm here with Parkers in Brookside and, and we're helping the housing authority here. Um, the tax credit program works off of 60% um, of the area median income. And so the rents are set at various levels there's a competitive process for applying for the tax credits, and so we would apply, as we did at Brookside, to set aside units at various levels, some at 60, some at lower uh, rent levels in the property. Um, but all of, the, all of the property needs to be at 60% of area median income or below as far as getting those tax credits. Um, the rents are set based on whatever the area median income for athens Clark County MSA is, and so they may go up, they may go down each year, uh, but HUD publishes those those income levels and what the allowable rents are. And you cannot rent for more than that level, and you also have to certify that the people living in the community are at income levels that meet that, that level. In other words, if you want to live in one of those apartments, we need to certify your income such that you're not above 60% area median <coughs> income, and likewise the rent can't be above that, that level. So and, and that the last is, 30 grand a year. Yeah. You know, and the last and the last point is median income is that point because lots of people don't necessarily know what that is. And I'm not going to go, I'm going to give an example rather than the exact number. The area median income is that point at which half of the population makes more than that amount and half of the population makes less than that amount. So if you're at 60% of the median income, that's really the bottom 30% of the population. So that's what you're talking about. Media, area median income broadly, just you know, without getting it exactly right, $50,000 in athens Clark County. So 60% of that is $30,000 a year. If you work that down to an hourly basis, that's basically somebody making $14,000, $15,000 a year who's out there working in the economy at a variety of different kinds of jobs. And so uh, that's, the, that's what we mean by we say low-income housing tax credit or moderate workforce subsidy levels. So you've got income based strictly on, uh, rent based strictly on income for deep subsidy. You have this sort of mid-range light duty subsidy of low-income housing tax credits. And then you have a mix of, uh, of uh, full market rate. No subsidy at all. You pay the rent that that unit would command on the open market. So I hope that answers. So the total number of units? So the total number of units, if it's one third, one third, one third, that hasn't been decided yet at all. Okay. We're still way too early, but let's use one third, one third. If there are roughly 200 units there now, and you do 200 units of tax credit, and you do 200 units of of market rate, now you're going from 190 units of housing to 600 units of housing. You're increasing housing in the downtown area, which is desirable. 
and you're also bringing in a lighter subsidy for working folks and increasing the amount of affordable housing because low-income housing tax credits are affordable housing right. as opposed to as opposed to for So you'd be doubling the number of affordable housing. Yes, so you're roughly you're roughly doubling it maybe more than that. We haven't finished the design uh, and what the site will bear and you know we haven't run the pro formas, we haven't met with the community, you know, this is yes. this is very, very early in the process. So take questions for about ten more minutes. Rick. I, I, this isn't a question. I guess it is a question. Um, all of the apartments at Bethel are not subsidized. Aren't there, aren't there some um, market rent apartments at Bethel? People are actually paying market rent. Yeah, just there are just a few that are that are um, uh, under a different program and there may be a couple of markets there's seven, there's seven units that are under the tax credit program so they are paying the up to the tax credit rent um 183 are the uh on the half contract the, the hud section 8 contract yeah. so on an average those seven what kind of rent are, are they paying do you know i believe those rents it depends on the bedroom size and and but i believe they're in the five four hundreds to six hundreds range um, and, it, and it's limited, they can't charge more than what the allowable tax credit rent is. Yeah. So. And then the last thing is that the Athens Housing Authority has, it's an esoteric thing, we still have some, some a little bit of subsidy units that if we can get units built, that we can apply some public housing subsidy. We just have a few of those left, and we might be able to uh, actually add a few deep subsidy public housing units into that into that mix there at that property as well. What and that all that will be discussed and planned for and looked at as we move as we move forward. Mm -hmm. But it's too early to tell you everything because we've got a lot of meetings with the residents and we've got a lot of meetings with the community that need to occur before we zero in on any final designs or numbers. The last thing I want to ask you to do Rick if possible is to explain the letter that the residents got that I showed you. Oh, yeah. When we leave here, somebody's going to say, that is not because I got this letter. Yeah. So yeah. it was so, a question I asked last night at the commission. Yeah, so we explained this a couple of times at our resident meeting. Um, once, once, the, uh, once we're finished with renovation, we can drive higher rents, but not resident rents. We can qualify for higher fair market rent levels for those properties. That's what it's called, the subsidy, the total subsidy amount. And so you're required by law, if you're looking at doing that, to notify all the residents on a couple of different occasions to give them a chance to talk about the property. And there's a, there's a contact at HUD that they can comment to. Uh, so because we're required by law to do that, uh, those have just gone out. And uh, the, so if you're just reading those and you're not reading them carefully, you first see, well, the rents are at this level and they're at high levels of rent, five, six, seven hundred dollars a unit, okay? And they're planning on going to eight or nine hundred, for example. And if you're a resident and you read that and you don't read it carefully, uh, then you might say, holy cow, they're raising my rent to those, low. how am I gonna be able to live here? I'm gonna have to move away. This is a major problem. You know, what are we gonna do? No, hear me carefully here. Those levels are what will be requested of HUD, the total rent load for the property. The residents only pay 30% of their rent. If the rents go up, HUD pays that difference the residents do not. The residents' rents now and into the future will always be based on 30% of their income. And no residents' rents will go up as a result of whichever path we follow, whether it's modernization, if SPLOS doesn't uh, pass, or total tramp, Brookside-like transformation, if it does pass. Resident rents will always be 30% of their income. Now, if their income goes up, their rent will go up. If their income goes down, their rent will go down. But 
Uh, we're required by law to send out those letters. Those letters have just gone out. We explain that to the residents who were at that meeting. We'll be explaining it to them again. When we meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, we'll assure them that their rents are not changing. Uh, but if you hear some rumor like that, or some, that's gotten out there in the community, nobody's rents will change. Everybody's rents will remain the same. Uh, the letter that went out is strictly a legal requirement before we can eventually petition the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development for higher rents as the result of all the improvements that are going to happen on the property. And that helps finance the improvements on the property and make uh, is part of the ability to allow us to do all those improvements on the property. So nobody's rents are going up, period. That's that's. That's an absolutely truthful statement. May I ask you a question, Rick? Yes. What was the turnout at that meeting? What would you guess, Kelly? 40, 50 folks? About, about 50 people total. And it will. So yeah. If not more. Yeah, if not more. And so, so not everybody was there. I have yet in my entire life to hold a resident <laughs> meeting in which every single you know, leaseholder on the property showed up for the meeting. And it's not, as I explained to them, uh, this is, that's not the only meeting that will occur. Uh, we will have lots and lots of additional resident meetings, and hopefully at different times of the day where different people will be able to attend. But we wanted the vast majority of the residents to hear about this issue first before it hit the newspaper. It simply was not fair for it to show up in the newspaper over the weekend because of the press release on, on Friday and the need to put out the press release on Friday. Uh, we, we just are deeply committed to the residents and involving them in the process, so we met with them first. There'll be lots more resident meetings to come. Jim was going to say. I was just going to add um, that that is that's correct. But if, if, if residents can't be there, um, what we do is is meet with them individually because there's a whole series of things, including the letter that Rick talked about, that are required to make sure that residents understand, make sure that they're sat with, make sure that they need to consent that they've received all that information. So we always have this where we try to have as many meetings and as many people to turn out. But if they don't. We keep track of that. We make sure that every household is met with individually. And then, of course, it'll be the individual work on it when we get to a point of any relocation. So I, we can commit to that as well. We did a similar development um, with this purchasing a property from the same owner um, in the past couple of years. It was 204 apartments. Um, and so all the things that Rick said uh, took place, and, and there was a very careful relocation of all the residents. Mm -hmm. uh, on a temporary basis, they were all moved back, uh, had the opportunity to move back. We also were able to add additional units at the site. So it's it's very real. There's a great deal of rights that are honored and the residents have. Um, and what really matters is the care that's taken with each individual family and, and how they're treated in that. But um, it is a necessary part of the development and relocation and, and, and renovation process. But um, it's something we take with great, uh, with great seriousness. Thanks, Karen. Bessie? Yeah, I just wanted to say um, that a lot of this conversation is great, and it's only as good as the relationships that you develop with the people in Bethel. Um, to the comments about this is their house, not their home, and um, nothing against whether you saw trash or not, because if you saw trash, there's always trash there. But these residents will take their own trash bags and walk around and fill them up and they will fill them up with their children by them side to teach their children to respect wherever it is that they lay their head at night. They do take a great deal of pride that Bethel is their home. And if you haven't been in their homes, then you need to go in their homes. Of course, you have to be invited. Mm -hmm. So to be invited, you have to be trusted. And to be trusted, you have to build relationships with them. And this isn't, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, I've been over to Bethel or I've been on Bethel's property. You can go on Bethel and you can never ever know anything about who lives in Bethel. And so my comment is that this is about developing relationships because the fear and the angst and the questions and how many units and how pretty it'll be, all of that goes away if they will trust you as a person. Um, my question is for all of you who are gonna be working on this project, 
you know, it sounds like you've all very supportive of it. I didn't, I wrote down, I didn't hear that anybody was not supportive of it. So what is that connection to your support of the SPLOS vote? Do you support that as well? Because supporting that means supporting this and, and, and to the residents, they, they do feel that way. And then my challenge would be that if you have not been in relationship, building relationship with these residents, then my challenge would be that you do. And by that, I don't mean go find somebody who you can get to know. I mean like get to know them, hear their story. Because there's the story of what you were talking about, but the more important story is the story of their lives, why they're there, who they are, how long they've lived there. Did they move there a month ago, like Rochelle, who I met, or have they lived there their entire lives with their family? This depth of understanding who they are goes a much longer way than trying to figure out whether we agree, disagree, and what we call it. So I don't even know why I feel compelled to say it, except for I've spent the last 20 years getting to know these people and living with them in community and not just handing them food and not just giving them bus tickets, but understanding where their need comes from and then empowering them to meet their own need so they don't feel like they have no dignity, that they're not enabled. They don't want to stay where they are. They want to have an opportunity to have a life like they want and expect for them and for their children. And I just, I just, I can't emphasize enough that the people and not the brick and mortar, but the relationship, because the relationship comes from building community. So I just, I'm excited about this. I'm passionate about this, clearly. Um, but I also, as a resident of athens Clark County, I want to know, you know, do you support this? And do you support it publicly or do you support it in your heart as well? Yeah, I think that's so important what you just said about building relationships with families. And I think that's one of the reasons I think we were successful in Columbia Brookside is that the housing authority had established a relationship by putting Jack Allwell's community at hand with the people. The Boys and Girls Club, yeah, absolutely. the housing authority gave a million dollars to the Boys and Girls Club. So it said to the community, we believe in you. We want you to have a safe place for kids to go each and every day. And that, 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 that is so crucial because I think that relationship made it easier for us to transition to Jack R. West because if people believe in the community, they could see, because I think we had trouble with one Athens. With one Athens, and you just you alluded to that early on, the people bought into one Athens and then they got slapped in the face. So the community needed something to validate the things we were going to do. That's why I think the Boys and Girls Club was so critical to build a community that they said that the housing authority was committed to the community. And I want to add another thing to that. The HT Edwards building, it was so critical, again, for the black community to believe in things would happen. Because before, my, my daughter, sister went to uh, over at North Athens. When they integrated it, it stinked like high heaven when she was over there. When they integrated it, they shut it down. Over at Lions, out at the airport, rocks would fly in. The kids would have to hide up under the building, up under the chairs. When they integrated it, they shut it down. So when they started talking about destroying the Edwards building, the black community said enough is enough. And I think low-income white people, low-income black people, rich white people, rich black people, all voted for Spelaw so we could have the Edwards building. So Spelaw gives all of us, and I had, my, my wife and I had discussed it all the time because she didn't believe in Spelaw. She thought Spelaw was an opportunity that more taxes. But she finally realized that's why we have the Edwards building. That's why we have the new school at Hillsman. That's why we have all the wonderful education facilities in athens Clark County. And we have all the help from other people because of Spiro. So yes, I agree with you. Building a relationship have helped the Howland Authority to form a bond with the community. And I think that's why I'm glad we're partnering with it because they can see that the Howland Authority, and we're passionate about it because we grew up in public housing. I mean, my daddy got a raise, they got a raise. 
No, I'm all bullshit. My, it, it's, it's, it's that that it works. And it was frustrating for a family. And finally, my mom saved up enough money. My mom making three dollars a, a day as a maid. My dad went to the poultry, and he would work twelve hours, and they would pay him six dollars. So I know the frustrations about trying to build wealth to try to help a community. And that's why it's so important that I want to be on the Board of Housing Authority that we can make a difference in family lives each and every day. And I'm, I'm going to, Vita, I want home ownership. Tim, I want home ownership. I want each and every person to have an opportunity to own a home. My mom was so happy. I never got a chance to stay in my mom's home. She bought a little house on, on Hancock. <laughs> on $3 a day, $15 a week. She was so happy to have a house. So we gonna have to, we gonna have to help working, I'm not talking only about black people, but working income white people too, who are struggling to maintain their homes here in Athens, Clark County. I said this at the meeting of the other day with Kelly, what are, what are you gonna do with $10 an hour and trying to stay here in Athens, Clark County? If it's not two of you working together, you are struggling. Let's be honest with you. So it's going to take all of us, and it's all of us, not just who at the table. You go back out in the community, you say, I expect you to have a decent place, and I'm going to work for that, of course. And I believe what you say, you're a community working together for. Thank you. I'd just add, uh, Betsy, on behalf of kind of not only the current elected officials, but those who were present last year, in evolution of the SPLOS package. Uh, everybody's been supportive of affordable housing. Um, and uh, I, I was going to consider it a success when we began calendar year 2018 if we got a decade long SPLOS with $30 million of local money, $3 million a year. Um, and it's now been successful beyond my wildest dreams because the commissioners kept pushing the ball upward and upward and upward. And now we're talking about almost $45 million of local tax dollars that are going to go to affordable housing over the course of a decade. And I think Mike hit the nail on the head. I, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a community that on a per capita basis has made a stronger local commitment to affordable housing for the tax dollars we spend. So, Y'all, I really appreciate uh, everybody gathering. Uh, Chair Daniel and I are going to execute this FLU now. <laughs> Our newsletter editor will shoot me if I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, sir. I think uh, this is about three copies. Okay. All right, if you start with one, I'll start with one. Let's see what the difference <laughs> Come on, everybody. <laughs> Ceremonial <laughs> pen. We may have to stack it too deep. Arlene, get on the corner so, so we can come up. Because otherwise, you get behind, we're not going to be able to see you. No. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right, everybody ready? Yeah. All right, let's rock this thing. Well, that's not your name. Kevin Curtis. There you are, sir. One more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
to the, to the city elected official. Jim and I were just talking, and based on the convert, uh, the, you know, Betsy's comments about staying engaged and building relationships, one of the things that we'll do is every time we schedule a resident meeting, we'll do a lot of them. We'll also do, youth, obviously, a community meeting, Jim, will have to raise the entire community. We'll include you. And, 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 